Evening. Good afternoon. Got uh, quite an event set up for you this afternoon, this evening. I watched it yesterday. I really liked that one. We're, uh, yeah, we're, it's, it's a little tricky to get them all up close on the table, like uh, some of the other fossils, but uh, it seems to work out. It's a, a little difficult to focus back on the mammoth, but I think it's big enough that everybody can, can make it out. Um, so the, uh, uh, I don't want to say, the feedback's been pretty good. And uh, I'm, I'm a little biased. I do like the Ice Age stuff a little bit, uh, a little bit more, but. Yeah, we watched a special on PBS about pandas last night. I was telling my husband all about the skulls you had and the broken teeth and stuff. Like they talked about the pandas had broken teeth. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hopefully everyone will enjoy the program tonight. I actually like these better than the dinosaur. <laughs> Myself. I, I think it helps that they're more relatable. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, you know, everything back here uh, that we talk about has some kind of modern living relative. So it's, it's something you could actually go to the zoo and see something that's pretty much just like it. And, yeah. Uh, or and either. I think a lot of the kids maybe have seen the Ice Age movies more than Jurassic Park. Right. If it's for their more for their age group, you know. Right. And uh, I have to admit, uh, I, I'm old enough where what I watched when I was a kid is totally different from what kids are watching now. <laughs> you watch Land of the Lost with the dinosaurs? <laughs> yeah, what Land of the Lost was one. And uh, yeah. a Jurassic Park came out, I think I was in the... Oh boy, seventh grade maybe. Oh, so it's an adult. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I don't know. It still feels like a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, and uh, oh, the of course with Ice Age, you know, we were there. Yeah. You know, with dinosaurs, uh, no one was quite around yet. The biggest mammals were the size of a house cat. We've take we've gone to that mammoth museum down at Kenosha too. Sure, that's actually uh, where our mammoth is from here. Oh, uh, you probably saw the original fossils then. Uh, Herbie here in the background is a, a replica of the he bear mammoth uh, from from Kenosha. Uh, that's actually uh, part of why I'm all dressed up here. We're going to talk about uh, some early humans along with uh, with the mammoths. No, we're hosting the anthropology one after this. And I know some of the libraries had made flyers and they put dinosaurs on them. I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to, this is after the dinosaurs. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this one's after the dinosaurs. And then I believe the, the next week program for you guys is uh, Women of Science. Women of Science. Right. Okay. That one's really hard to do a sneak preview of, uh, but, uh, but it's a really good program. We got to go over uh boy more than a dozen uh scientists and uh researchers and uh women have made incredible discoveries it's uh, it's a really good program yeah her, one of our third teachers i'm gonna book for her she wants it in i think February is women's history month okay so so we're hoping we can yeah so looks like my my four o'clock alarm here um did you want me to swap over the host option for you or if you want me to then more than fine doing that sure you. uh go ahead and do that because uh with this one I, I tend to be further back from the um what you call it uh from the computer computer yep no problem there we go Looks like we're all set up. Okay, so we can uh, go ahead and go ahead and get started here. Since uh, looks like we're we're at four o'clock. Uh, four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, well, did you have any uh, announcements for the library or? 
All nope. Right. Just keep watching and stay tuned for more. All right. Well, then we'll uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, thanks for joining us here at Colossal Fossils, everybody, on this cold, wet, rainy, icy, snowy kind of ice agey sort of day. Uh, well, for tonight's program or this afternoon's program, rather, you can see I'm a little dressed up, and uh, well, that's because I'm going to be your tour guide here while we go through Ice Age Wisconsin. I'm going to introduce you to a number of megafauna, that is to say giant animals from the Ice Age that live right here in Wisconsin. Uh, you can probably actually see several of them behind me here. Now, I, I will admit I'm a little biased. I really like this particular program because what I do for the museum what we call experimental archaeology. I study the people who lived alongside and hunted and were occasionally hunted by the animals that we're going to talk about tonight. So all of my get up here to look like a caveman, my stone tools, and what I was actually working on before the program here, bone, leather, all of it is based on artifacts of our ancient ancestors. So as we talk about our uh, megafauna, our great beasts of the Ice Age here tonight, we're gonna talk about our ancestors a little bit as well. Now, tonight's program is a little different from the previous ones. Uh, previous programs, I've been sitting right up close to the, the screen here, but the fossils that we have to share with you tonight are so large, uh, I need a lot more room to present them the way I'd like to present them. Our, uh, our woolly mammoth here, I mean, on the screen, he looks like he's only this big, right? Um, I, I promise, I'll show you in a second here, he's huge. So uh, we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions at the end of the program, just like we have previously. Uh, so if you have any questions, anything you wanna better look at while I'm uh, talking about stuff, I will make sure you have time for that. And uh, if, uh, I step too far back and the microphone doesn't pick up, you can't hear me real well, just go ahead and let me know and I'll make the adjustment. But I think we got everything set up for this. So uh, without further ado, let's go take a look at the Ice Age. So first thing, an Ice Age kind of comes with a little bit of a misconception. Uh, most everybody thinks Ice Age is constant winter, like North Pole, ice and glaciers and snow, 365 days a year. That's not quite right. An ice age is a period of cold where the environment has, uh, has shifted for some reason and it can be caused by solar activity, ocean currents, volcanoes, any number of things, even some things that we don't fully understand. Now, an ice age, means the winters will be colder, they'll be longer, spring and fall come later or earlier, and they're cooler. Depending on where you are, it might be wetter or drier. Summer still happens every year, just like it does now, but it's much shorter and usually it doesn't get as warm. Say in central Wisconsin here, uh, you know, summer we can get up into the mid 80s or 90. During an ice age, we might only hit 70 degrees, or maybe even not even that. It might be down in the 60s. It might stay cool enough where uh, the glaciers and the snow up on hilltops and in valleys don't completely melt. So that next winter, they're starting snow up on top of an already formed cold layer. Over time, that builds up. Now, the last ice age, Wisconsin had glaciers that covered a good part of the state, uh, with the exception of what we call the driftless zone. In that area of Wisconsin, we had all of these animals. Now, uh, has, has anybody seen the Ice Age movie, the animated Ice Age movie? Several of you? Yeah, a few of you. So we are going to introduce you to uh, the main characters from Ice Age. Now, first and foremost, you can't miss him right here. We have Herbie in the background. Now, like I said, on the screen, Herbie looks pretty small. You remember the Velociraptor 
He looked pretty small. I stood up next to him and he was tiny, right? Well, remember, I am five foot six inches tall. My spear, we call an atlatl dart, is six feet long. Now, I'm going to walk back to where that woolly mammoth is and show you just how big Herbie is. Everybody ready? Herbie is massive. The tusks alone are 11 feet long. That is my height plus the length of my spear. In life, Herbie stood 16 feet tall and weighed more than four tons. Now that is about four feet taller than your average Tyrannosaurus Rex. And he weighed as much as the garbage truck that comes by your house once a week to pick up the garbage can. They were massive animals. Now to be fair, Herbie is uh, he's the he beer mammoth he was found in Kenosha. He's actually the largest woolly mammoth that's been found in the North American continent. He's a huge mammoth. Average size was a little smaller, around 12 to 13 feet tall and three to four tons, still bigger than a modern elephant. Now, the woolly mammoth, we all know they're cold adapted, right? They're covered in fur. They've got big, huge curving tusks and lots of fat so they can stay warm all winter long. But a neat thing about them, our ancestors, humans in Europe, in Asia, in North America, wherever you happen to be from, they hunted and ate woolly mammoths. Herbie here was somebody's dinner. Now, what's neat about that is that not only was this animal four tons, 16 feet tall, hunted by early humans about, about my size, but it turned out he is proof that people were in Wisconsin almost 15,000 years ago. At the time of his discovery, that was the oldest evidence of people in North America at all. And it was right here in Wisconsin. Now, today we found some older sites, but it's still important to keep in mind, somebody actually hunted and ate him. They used stone tools, very much like this, to take the meat back to the village. And that left scratch marks on the bones. And actually at the site where we found Herbie, we found a couple of broken and used up stone tools, kind of rough pieces of stuff like this. Now, Before we talk too much more about Herbie, I want to show you guys something really neat. To hunt a woolly mammoth, uh, we don't use a, a hand-thrown spear. Be about this size. You're not going to do what they do in the movies and run up and poke at the woolly mammoth. A lot of people think that's what happens. Now they'd be using stone points like this. And we usually find the stone points because rocks don't decay like bones do, so we call it the Stone Age. A lot of tools, it turns out, are things like this one, bone and antler. Now, to get a woolly mammoth, an Ice Age person about five and a half, maybe six feet tall, is using a tool like this, we call an atlatl. This is a spear thrower. It works with a spear between six and eight feet long, occasionally longer. It's got a little divot in the back. It looks like a giant arrow and it hooks to the end like this. When I use that at metal to throw this spear, I get about halfway through the throw. I let go of the spear and I give it a flick of the wrist. I can throw that spear the length of a football field. Now, that's important to remember because elephants, mammoths, they're kind of smart. They're really strong. And if you're my size, that mammoth sees that, uh, that you're hunting it, all it has to do is come up and, uh, and then, you know, I'm really squished and I don't get to eat my mammoth sandwich. Now, 
spear went halfway down the museum. I hardly even tossed it. Works really well. Now, the woolly mammoth here, they're definitely not defenseless. They're huge animals. They've got 11 foot long tusks, but for the most part, they just spend their time eating. A mammoth has to eat about a half ton of food every day just to keep itself going and keep itself warm. Now, uh, I don't know about uh, where everybody is here, but uh, in Wausau last night, night before last, we got about three, four inches of snow. So I had to shovel a walk for the first time in October. So uh, we're actually starting out with some good ice age weather here. Yeah, I was the same level of excitement I had about that. Now, I gotta ask any of you watching, help your folks shovel the, the front sidewalk when it snows? A couple of you? You wanna come shovel my sidewalk? No? Well, the woolly mammoth here is the world's first snowplow. So most animals today and during the ice age, the big grazing animals, they, they don't like to stick around when it snows. They tend to migrate, they tend to move. And mammoths did too, but because they have to eat so much, they have a really neat trick. These tusks are curved into a corkscrew shape. So they grow out of the, the mouth like so. This particular tusk is from a young female. It's about half the size of Herbie's tusks. She was, uh, oh, about 10 years old or so. Uh, you know, she wasn't quite full grown. If we look at the shape, the cross section of this tusk, you can see it's flatter side to side than it is top to bottom. The woolly mammoth is the world's first snowplow. They would take these curved tusks, stick their tusks, their face down in the snow, and throw them uh, the snow side to side. They'd move these tusks back and forth and clear out the snow all the way down to the ground. Then they take their trunk. It's unlike a modern elephant trunk that's round in cross section. Mammoth trunks are flattened. They could use their trunk to make a snowball. They'd scoop that snow out of the way and pull up the grass and keep eating all winter long. Now, a really neat thing about woolly mammoths, uh, woolly rhinos, cave bears, all these animals from the Ice Age, that they lived right alongside us. So unlike dinosaurs, uh, where it's, it's a lot of guesswork. It's trying to figure out how the bones fit together, how the muscles grew on the bones, whether they had scales or feathers. With animals like Herbie, people lived side by side with them. We saw them. And we left art that shows what they looked like. Now this is a 30,000 year old sculpture, a carving made from mammoth tusk from central France. I'm not, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the, the name of the site because my French is terrible and I will butcher it. But this was carved using stone tools, said, you know, sharp rocks out of woolly mammoth tusk. And what's more, in particular, a cave called Lascaux. Uh, Lascaux uh, Cave in France. They left some really, really nice cave paintings, in some cases so detailed that we can tell individual animals apart from the pictures of the caves. They got specific markings on specific animals and they painted them over and over doing different things. So we can take cave art and sculptures, first-hand eyewitnesses that saw these animals, that lived with them, sometimes ate them, sometimes probably got eaten by them, and we can see what they really look like. Now, woolly mammoth is a grazing animal. It's eating grass. Now, this is a woolly mammoth tooth. And 
a lot of folks tell me it looks like a little woolly mammoth, right? It's, he's got his little trunk over here in his head and it's, it's a mammoth tooth that looks like a mammoth. Oh, uh, I think that's completely accidental, but that's kind of true. If we look at this, elephants, woolly mammoths, the next animal we're gonna talk about, mastodons, they only have four teeth. They have two upper and two lower molars, the chewing teeth. And the mouth of the animal, if it yawned, you would only see about that much of it, that top part. If we look on the woolly mammoth, it looks like the bottom of a tennis shoe. It's really flat, fine grooves, and that's because they're eating grasses and herbs and like salad greens, soft plants. That's pretty much all they do. They walk around and graze like a modern cow. Their cousins, they took a completely different tact. This is a mastodon tooth. Now, this thing is gnarly, right? Actually, some of the, the people who found these uh, a couple thousand years ago thought they were teeth from giant monsters called cyclops, these huge giants with one eye, flesh-eating beasts, right? There, stuff like this is the source of mythology, or like the mastodon bone back here. That I'm going to show you in just a moment. Now, mastodons, they lived in the forest. I can show you here, they looked somewhat different than woolly mammoths. They were about the same size, but mammoth had this huge hump of muscle on its shoulders and the back of its head to support those curved tusks while it sweeps the snow out of the way. Mastodon was a little shorter, a little stockier, and almost flat along the back. Their tusks were long and straight, and they were adapted to push their way through the forest. They lived in trees, and their diet was not soft plants and grass like the mammoth. It was woody stuff, pine cones, acorns, tree bark, pine needles, stuff like that, except this time of year. Does anybody watching you guys do a jack-o'-lantern for Halloween? Yeah? Oh, you like pumpkin pie? Yeah, I like pumpkin pie. Mastodons loved pumpkins. Now, some uh, paleontologists who are studying coprolite, now that's fossilized poo. There are actually people who get paid to study fossil poo. They discovered that when wild squash, these kind of gourds related to pumpkins, but not the same thing about the same shape and size, when they came into season, the mastodons loved them. They ate them like candy. You know, all that squishy, stringy stuff you pull out of the jack-o'-lantern? They ate that too. The seeds, rinds, the whole thing. They just put it in their mouth and mashed it up. These guys were living wood chippers, but they really loved squash. Now, I want to show you just how big these animals are. This is a thigh bone upper leg bone of an adult mastodon out of Boaz, Wisconsin. That's right, these guys lived right here in Wisconsin. Now, if this animal was standing next to me, its knee would be about equal with my head. So you can see a little bit bigger than a modern African elephant. They were huge animals. But because the mammoths lived out in the uh, the prairies and the plains, what we call the mammoth steppe, the mastodon stayed in the forest. They could both eat their fill and actually not compete with each other. So they coexisted pretty peacefully. Now, next up, when it comes to coexisting peacefully, um, now this fellow wasn't so good at that. So this this is our woolly rhino. Now woolly rhinoceros was a little bigger than a modern uh, modern white rhino, and uh, they were shaped a little different. Like the woolly mammoth, they had a big hump of muscle along the back and shoulders into the neck because 
Well, modern rhinoceros, they use their horns for defense. They're kind of shaped like the Triceratops horn. They're long and straight, round, and very sharp at the end. Woolly rhino, he used his horns like the mammoth uses his tusks. They're flat, front to back, real wide, and he sticks his nose down in the snow and uses that big curved horn that's about three feet long to clear snow and ice out of the way so that he can get to the grass. Just like modern rhinoceros, they had long lips that they use their lips to kind of pull up the grass. They don't have biting teeth incisors on the front, but they've got a lot of molars. They chew up their grass, their plants, just like a cow. Now, just like a modern rhinoceros, we think they had pretty good hearing and a really good sense of smell, but not very good eyesight. And well, rhinos, uh, they don't do their homework. They're, uh, they're not known for their intelligence. They're actually kind of dumb. Um, I've actually seen a video of a rhinoceros where uh, when they get startled, they tend to attack. This rhino was wandering around grazing and he saw a termite mound, so a bug nest, and it startled him for whatever reason. And so he turned and attacked it and he wrecked this thing. Now termites, they're not like ants, they don't even bite, they eat wood. They're little plant eating colony bugs. They build these big uh, mounds out of dirt there are no danger to a rhinoceros at all, but the rhino decided this thing was dangerous and he went and knocked it over. We think these guys were pretty aggressive, just like modern, uh, modern rhinoceros. So though we do find that our, uh, our ancestors did eat them from time to time, uh, this would have been a really dangerous animal to go after. We don't think that it was uh, necessarily on the top of the menu. Now, Rhinoceros today are highly endangered animals. And part of the reason for that is that uh, people hunt them because they think their horns have medicinal properties. Something I wanna point out because we can see it really well on our woolly rhino here. There's nothing medicinal about a rhinoceros horn. In fact, uh, elephant horn and mammoth tusk rather is made of ivory, it's made of teeth. Uh, now, tusks like on a wild boar, for example, those are made of teeth. Well, the horns of a rhinoceros, they're made of hair. Really, really densely grown, very coarse hair. So if you try to make medicine or some magic potion out of a rhinoceros horn, you'd get the exact same stuff by taking a big tuft of hair and chewing on it, I guess. So rhinoceros horn has no magical medicinal qualities at all. But that also means that as they wear this out, as they use it up clearing snow and ice, it can keep growing just like our hair keeps growing or our fingernails. And it's textured very much like our fingernails. It's that same kind of stuff. Put him down because he's heavy. I'm getting uh, getting my workout in tonight. So mastodons, mammoths, woolly rhinos, they all have living relatives today, things that we can go to the zoo and see, right? They like they look like elephants, they look like rhinoceros. Well, next up, I would like to introduce you to Sid. If you've seen the Ice Age movie, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Now, Sid, they do have living relatives today, but, uh, but nothing like this big guy. Now this. This is the giant ground sloth. As you can see, He's got a pretty big skull. He's a big animal. Would have weighed a couple of tons, maybe two to three tons. Walked around on all fours, had a long tail. They were able to stand up on their hind legs and 
Well, Sid here could reach as high as a modern giraffe, up to about 18 feet. They were massive animals. In Ice Age, when they show you Sid the sloth, um, well, he's, he's kind of a small sloth. He's a little guy. He should be able to look Manny right, to, right in the eyes. And they always show him as kind of dirty. Now, sloths here, like this ground sloth, he's got his eye socket, his eyeball right here. So he's got decent eyesight. His eyes are on the side of his head, so he can see a wide range of, of space, so he's hard to sneak up on. His hearing's okay, it's probably about like ours. Modern sloths hear pretty well. But his nose is really well developed. He's got a great sense of smell. So he's not gonna be a dirty, stinky uh, Sid like in Ice Age. He's actually gonna you know, be like any other animal with good smell. If he stinks so much he can't smell anything, he's easier to sneak up on. Now, uh, funny little detail, for a long time, reconstructions of these guys has been done where they have a long tongue. They use kind of like a giraffe uses its long tongue to reach out, grab plants, and pull it into their mouths. And they started doing that because their teeth have a gap on the front. But as it turns out from studying the muscle attachments, how the skulls go together, they've got a strong bite, but their tongue can't stick out all that far, not any farther than, than any of us. You know, like, eh. Right now, instead, we now think they have prehensile lips like a rhinoceros, where they can use their lips to pick up individual leaves and grab stuff and kind of nip at it. Like our mammoth, though, they've got flat teeth, well, they're a very different shape. We think he's eating softer plants, nothing too hard or too coarse. Now you'd think he's not very smart. He's really big. The well, sloths are not fast runners, right? Everyone knows sloths are slow. Well, Sid here is not without his defense. So I'm gonna put his skull down here so I don't drop him. This is a claw from the little finger the pinky finger. The rest of them got bigger than this. They're very heavily muscled. This is all muscle here. And we think that like a modern sloth, they kind of had a hook to them. When he walked, he probably actually had them up off the ground like this so that he'd almost knuckle walk, kind of like an ape does. But when he'd reach up into the trees, to feed, he could use these hooks to pull the branches down and then he could use his lips to get those leaves. But those forearms are very powerfully muscled, which means when he rears up on his hind legs, he can bat with his front arms and defend himself with these massive hooked claws, just like a modern bear does. So it would make a sloth like Sid surprisingly difficult to eat, even for somebody like Esther back here. Now, Neat little trivia fact for you guys. The modern sloth, two-toed and three-toed sloths, they live in trees. Giant ground sloth could not climb trees. A three-ton animal would just pull the tree right over. We don't think that they could do this, but modern sloths have such a low metabolism, that is they digest their food so slowly that they can actually eat poisonous plants and the acids in their stomach break down the poisons before they absorb them because it's such a slow process. So they can actually avoid being poisoned by being so slow. Some of them are actually so slow and so lethargic that uh, they've even been observed with algae growing in their fur because it rains and they get wet and they just hang there and they actually grow pond scum in their fur. Yeah, aren't you glad we don't have that problem? Now, I want to really just show you how big we're talking here with Sid. This is the, the back leg of that giant ground sloth. You can see how big his foot is. Other than being massive, you know, it's as big as my torso. 
it's actually built very much like ours. He's got a very big, uh, strong, well-developed heel bone and a flat foot, so he can stand up on his hind legs. You notice you don't want to get stepped on by a giant ground sloth. He's got big claws, but if I put his foot on the ground and show you, this is his, his hip joint here. His waist, his hip bone is up to my chest. So with the rest of his body and his neck and his head, he could touch the ceiling in here without any problem at all. Really a big, heavy animal. Now, next up, this fellow. Now this one in particular is neat because uh, unlike our previous animals here, these are still alive today. They actually survived the end of the last ice age where mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, woolly rhinos died out and it's just their relatives. We actually still have bison around today. Now this is an American bison. That's very closely related to things like cows and uh, you know, Cape buffalo, water buffalo, stuff like that. They're all in that same family, but bison, bison are really impressive animals. Up to about a couple hundred years ago, they had herds that were so big. There are firsthand accounts of people, cowboys and fur traders that went out west that said that the herd would start passing by a location and millions of animals would go by. It would take two or three days for the herd to pass a given point while they waited and just watched millions of these animals go by. And by the time they were done, the ground was grazed and trampled down to bare dirt. So they were always moving. Now, for a number of reasons, not too long after that, they were over hunted. And today they're endangered, but they're coming back. They're doing well. And actually there are uh, several theories out there that say that that number was not, uh, not normal, that it was an, an unnatural high population because they had been breeding without huge ice age predators hunting them for 10,000 years. And so they were able to just explode as a population. But in either case, we still have bison around today. Now bison are, uh, they're very impressive animals. This one standing next to me, his head would be about the same height as my head. And the height of the hump on its back could be over seven feet. A good size one can weigh over 2000 pounds. They're massive animals. Now our ancestors, uh, North Americans, uh, Native Americans during the Ice Age and after hunted bison and it was a very important part of their, their diet and their culture. I actually know a guy who used one of those atlatls, the spear thrower and stone points like this as part of an experimental archaeology program with Texas A&M University and they hunted a bison with one of those spear throwers. They were able to kill the bison with a single spear. Then they butchered it out and processed it, tanned the hide and the meat, made tools out of the bones, all with Stone Age technology to better understand how people did that 10,000 years ago. It was a really neat experiment. And the bison that they got was about this size. I weighed in at something like 1,200 pounds. That is a lot of food. Now bison, they're kind of aggressive animals. They're big, you know, they're heavy, they're surprisingly fast and unusual for grazers. They actually have a lot of endurance. They can run at 30 miles an hour for a good distance. You don't want to be on the receiving end of a headbutt from a bison. Now, one of these animals is strong enough that with just a flick of its head, it could throw me 30 feet up into a tree over there. So gotta give them some respect if you're hunting bison with pointy sticks. But bison, buffalo were an important source of food for a lot of Ice Age animals, not just Ice Age people. Now, uh, in Wisconsin today, we've got a couple of predators 
we have black bears, we have timber wolves if you get far enough north up by me here. Uh, we've got cougars, which are actually surprisingly common, but we don't see them very often. Anybody who has a cat knows they're very good at hiding. Occasionally we get a wolverine that wanders down from the upper peninsula of Michigan into the north woods and kind of does its thing. Um, and we have coyotes, which are kind of on the small side, but we'll count them anyway. Now that's it for big predators in Wisconsin, apart from your occasional deer hunter. During the Ice Age, Wisconsin looked more like the African savanna, as far as the animals are concerned. We had horses, we had camels, we had uh, antelopes, we had, of course, deer, elk, moose, buffalo, mastodons, woolly rhinos, all of these animals here, many of them that we think of as being natives to Africa today. Little side note, horses actually evolved in North America, migrated across the Northern Hemisphere, went extinct in North America at the end of the last ice age, and then were brought back and reintroduced when Europeans came over here in the 1500s. So horses made their way back the long way. But all of these animals were hunted by a whole myriad of predators, most of which we don't have here today. There was a North American hyena. There were, of course, timber wolves, cougars, and black bears like we have today. But we still had grizzly bears. We had giant short-faced bears. We had American lions, which were bigger than a modern African lion. We had saber-toothed cats. And well, first up on the list that I'm going to introduce you to, we had the dire wolf. Now, uh, does anybody watching this have a dog at home? Yeah, the, a big dog for most folks is something like a lab or a German shepherd. It might get up to 100 pounds if they're really well fed. Uh, usually, they stand about yay high. My mother-in-law's got a, a German shepherd mixed puppy, and he's, he's about this big. That's a pretty good size for a, a domestic dog. A coyote is about that same size if they get to be a good size, a little lighter, a little more uh, thinly built. A modern wolf will stand a little bit taller than that, weigh up to about 125 pounds if they're well fed, a big wolf. Uh, some Arctic wolves can get even bigger. Dire wolf, he'd stand about chest high on me could weigh up to 300 pounds and has an absolutely terrifying bone crushing bite. Now these are wolves that were specialized to hunt megafauna, to hunt big game. In some places we think that their diet was composed of as much as 90% bison. So they were eating large animals all the time. You can see here, this is a sagittal crest. This is a flange of bone that is muscle attachment. The muscles that close the jaws attach down here. They run under the cheekbone, behind the eyes, and attach all the way back to here. On a dire wolf, this is an exaggerated crest. This is big. These animals had a powerful bite. Unfortunately for the dire wolves, to make room for all that muscle, this round area of the skull back here, that's the brain case. They got really, really strong, but less smart. We actually think that might be part of why we don't have dire wolves around anymore. The other reason is that unlike modern timber wolves and coyotes, for example, that'll hunt things like rabbits or gophers or mice when deer and larger animals are hard to find, these guys were big animal specialists. We don't think that they could catch small animals to feed themselves when the environment started changing 12,000 years ago. But absolutely massive animals. And as far as we can tell, just like modern wolves, they hunted in packs cooperatively. So if you had to face down a dire wolf in the Ice Age, you didn't just have to deal with one, you had several. Now I mentioned, I mentioned that today in Wisconsin we have black bears. This is a skull 
of a modern North American black bear. Uh, we talked to a guy who's actually a black bear expert and he said this animal would have been about 250 pounds and about six feet tall on its hind legs. It was a young male, not quite full size, but getting pretty close. He was a little bigger than I am. A good sized black bear can top out at 400 pounds and uh, six and a half feet tall. They can get to be pretty big. I've got a black bear hide that I'm tanning that's uh, almost that big. And bears, like black bears here, they're, they're what we call uh, opportunistic omnivore. They can and do eat anything. Now they're definitely capable predators. They have sharp teeth, large canines. You can see they have a well-developed sagittal crest, nowhere near the size of the dire wolf, but still pretty good. Bears have good eyesight, at least as good as people, good hearing, but a very good sense of smell, as good or better than most dogs. So they can find food, they can see you coming, they're definitely capable predators. Most of the time they like to eat berries, tubers, bugs, mice, small things that won't fight back or run away, but they can be dangerous. Now during the ice age, of course, we still had grizzly bears in the state of Wisconsin, which a grizzly bear, well, they're somewhat larger than our little black bear friend here. They can average up around eight feet tall when they stand up on their hind legs. And a good sized grizzly bear can push a thousand pounds. Just for comparison here, we'll show you black bear's tooth, grizzly bear tooth much, much bigger animal. Today, the largest bears we have wandering around are, uh, oh, they're neck and neck for the lead right now, the polar bear or the Alaskan Kodiak brown bear. Now they both get up to around nine feet, nine and a half feet tall and uh, 12 to 1300 pounds. So better than a half ton. The Kodiak bear's claws are longer than my index finger, around six inches long. They're incredibly huge animals, but during the last ice age, completely outclassed. This big fellow is Fuzzy. And Fuzzy was a bear. Now, this is the giant short-faced bear. If we were doing this in person, I would actually show you this by having somebody come up. His jaws are so big, I could fit some, one of your head in his mouth. He could literally bite your whole head with a single bite. The giant short-faced bear was a massive animal. Now this thing, remember I'm five and a half feet tall if we had the entire bear here standing on all fours, he could rest his chin on top of my head. They stood six feet at the shoulder. When they reared up on their hind legs, they could top 12 feet. That is tall enough to look T-Rex eye to eye. And the biggest ones that we found would have weighed more than 2,000 pounds. Now, not only were they massive, but they had relatively long legs for a bear, so we think they were fast. The largest of them from South America, uh, from looking at the teeth, the structure of the, the minerals in their teeth, we think that it actually ate more plants, but their North American counterpart, like Fuzzy here, we think they were hyper carnivores. Their diet seems to have been comprised mostly of meat. And like our dire wolf, they've got a massive area for muscle attachment. In fact, this bear's jaw muscles are bigger than my leg muscles. This beast could crush bone with no problem at all. Now real quick, I would like to point out our dire wolf and our short faced bear here have this kind of interesting, unique dark color. Uh, that's because they were found in the La Brea tar pits. 
Now, La Brea Tar Pit is a really neat place. It's what we call a predator trap. Uh, it is a, a place in Southern California where oil bubbles up out of the ground naturally, just like a spring water in Wisconsin here. Uh, the, the substance, we call it asphaltum. And it's actually the same stuff that we use to mix with gravel to make asphalt, to make the blacktop. Uh, traditionally, people in the area would actually use it as glue, but it's completely waterproof. So when it rains, it ends up looking like a pond. And what happens, an animal like say our giant sloth or woolly mammoth will go out there to get a drink and it gets stuck in this stuff like super quicksand and it can't get out. Well, predators and scavengers hear the struggle or smell the dead animals and they think it's an easy meal. So they go out there to scavenge or to get some easy supper and they get caught. They get stuck and they end up preserved there like fuzzy. Fuzzy here. He was an old bear. You can see his teeth are actually worn flat. So we think he was kind of slowing down and old and tired and he went out there for an easy snack and got stuck himself so he could join us. La Brea tar pits have turned up more than a hundred dire wolves, something like 70 odd bears and at least as many saber tooth cats. Not to mention hyenas and giant vultures, all kinds of other predators and uh, scavengers that went out there and got stuck. Now, last but not least, behind me here, as I've been talking, you can see Esther. Now, Esther is a saber-toothed cat. Now, saber-toothed cat, we call her Smilodon fatalis. She's named Esther after a very nice lady who donated to the museum so we could get the skeleton. For comparison, this is a modern day clouded leopard. Now, this is important because this leopard has the longest fangs of any cat relative to its body size, any mammal in fact. It's basically a modern day saber tooth, but a clouded leopard weighs about 25 to 30 pounds. It's a little bigger than a, a small dog, like a, a beagle, for example, right? Uh, they're fairly short. They're very fast, very stealthy. For comparison here, we can show you a 400 pound African lion actually has the same size canines. Esther back there, is in a class of her own. It's that same lion tooth next to a Smilodon uh, canine. Uh, Esther's canine teeth are almost as long as a T-Rex tooth. The black part here was rooted deeply inside the skull, so they were very strong. If we look, if I can get it to focus for you, the front and back edge of that tooth is serrated and sharp like a shark's tooth, and it's a narrow blade-like tooth. Now, that's an important adaptation for Esther. Now, unlike a crocodile or a T-Rex or a shark, uh, if Esther breaks or loses one of those teeth, that's it, it's gone. And we do find skulls where they have a broken tooth or occasionally even both teeth. If they lose both teeth, there's not a lot of wear on the, the broken part of those teeth. So it, it's a good indicator that they can't survive very well without those, those fangs. Esther here is a highly adapted vampire cat. Now that doesn't mean she's a blood drinker, but she uses her fangs that same way. Her back legs are actually shorter than mine. We don't think she's very fast. She has to be very sneaky. Now, there we go. Uh, her front legs are longer than her back legs. So she actually would have had a gait like a hyena where she, you know, stand higher up in the front. But her front legs, her shoulders, her, her forelimbs are built. She is stacked like a bodybuilder. She's got powerful hooked claws, just like a modern lion. And the muscles in her neck are also very strong and reinforced and anchored. She's a powerful animal. And we think the way she hunted was to sneak up as close as possible to something like a bison or a moose, a large animal. 
she'd pounce out of cover, grab onto it, and actually wrestle it down to the ground, physically pull that animal down, and then you use her fangs to bite at the throat, at the neck, like a vampire. And that's how she'd make the kill. We don't think that these teeth would stand up very well to biting on bones, especially on a struggling animal. The problem with that is that that also means that Esther can only really eat the soft parts of the kill. She can eat the internal organs and you know, leg muscles and stuff like that, but any meat on the ribs or the spine, the backbone, that sort of thing would be hard for her to get at. So she was a very good, very effective predator, but she was probably also a scavenger's best friend. Now at 600 pounds, she's bigger than the largest African lions today by about 200 pounds. She's a huge animal. If I'm standing next to her on the ground, she's almost shoulder high on me. So uh, personally, I'm kind of glad I don't have to worry about running into an Esther while I'm out camping like our ancestors did. Now, uh, I heard my alarm go off there. I know we're, we're coming up on the, the end there. Does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about today or want to see some of these fossils a little closer up again? Looks like we got lots of questions. Awesome. All right. Well, we're, we're getting it going here. Jessica, can you unmute? There you go. Uh, there we go. What the f what's your favorite? Ice Age Amino. Amino. Oh, well, my favorite Ice Age animal is, uh, well, I guess I can't say uh, caveman, can I? <laughs> it's probably actually the woolly mammoth. I think those guys are awesome. If, uh, if scientists do manage to clone an extinct animal, there's a good chance that a woolly mammoth would be one they could do. I would definitely go see one of those guys in a zoo. I think that would be awesome. You know, get a mammoth ride, right? Where did you go? Right, looks like uh, Jonathan Hustis. Okay. okay. Um. Um, with all the way by the, the all the way with the first one where you said, um, mine behind was, you, behind you, with the big things on the side of them, my yep. older with the older, the softy things. Oh, these right that's here? That's soft, right? That, that's the woolly mammoth's tusks. That's two of its teeth. Um, where's the amino in this side? By that big giant um, bee? Some thunder. Uh, by the big giant bee, I mean, this right here? Yeah, um, mine know where those are. Them, um, them soft. Yeah, those are the tusks like this. Yeah, this I would throw you those tusks up horns. close, but... They each weigh Give almost as much horns. as I do. It takes three of us to move that woolly mammoth around. Did you hear it? Three people. Um, do you know that thing um, in this That's side? That's a bone. That bone, bone over there? That big bone? That big bone. What's that amino called? Oh. By the bone? Big bone? Yeah, the big bone over there in the right. corner? No, like no. totally another side, like on the wall, I think, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that teeth thing. Oh, that's the mastodon, too. Where's dinosaurs it come from? I I see them. that one, that one, this one is a different one, that one, is oh, that just from them. Am I see it on your shirt? Yep. That's copied off of a cave painting from a cave in, uh, in France. 
Ooh. Oh. <laughs> you put fire up. <laughs> the fire hung you. Fire behind him. Yep. Okay, let other yep. people. Yeah, out. fire is uh, yeah, it's cold outside. <laughs> Erin has so a question. Do you have Aaron? any? Do you have any real um, woolly mammoth skeletons that still have the fur on them? Uh, we don't have any uh, here at the museum, but we have actually found several woolly mammoths that were frozen thousands of years ago and actually stayed frozen for tens or sometimes 15, 20,000 years in places like Siberia. And over the past uh, couple decades, we found what we call ice mummies for woolly mammoths, woolly rhinos, different species of uh, relatives of bison called musk ox, um, even uh, dire wolves and even cave lions. Uh, so they do exist, which is really neat because then we can look at it and see how the whole animal fits together, what colors it were, and we can actually tell how accurate our cave paintings were. And we find they were really pretty good. So people have found that before. I would love to get one in the museum, but they're really, really rare. <laughs> Olin has a question too. Go ahead, Aaron. That'd be cool to find one of them in the ice, a huge skeleton with all the fur and everything. Yeah, it would be. All right, is it uh, Nolan? Looks like mm -hmm. you got your hand up. Go ahead. How did the Ice Age people like come up with those bow and arrows and stuff? That is one of the questions that I would love to be able to answer. We're not really sure even when the first one was invented. Now we think that the first people started using thrown spears about 400,000 years ago before, uh, before we were actually technically modern people. Somewhere around 55 to 60,000 years ago, somebody figured out how to throw a spear with another stick like this but we're not sure when or even where exactly. The first ones that we find artifacts for are just barely 20,000 years old, but they show up in places where people were isolated way before that. And they use those tools, places like Australia. Now, uh, we can use that to kind of figure out when people started using them because in Australia, the Aborigine cultures, the Aborigine peoples use versions of the spear throwers. They never developed the bow and arrow, but they have woods in Australia that make good bow and arrow wood. They were certainly able to. So what that tells us is when people got to Australia 50 to 75,000 years ago, they knew how to use these. But when they got isolated in the last 20 or so thousand years before people started using bow and arrows, they never learned. <laughs> They never got that technology. So we kind of have to guess. Uh, maybe you'll end up as the, the paleontologist who, uh, or the archeologist who discovers an 80,000 year old spear thrower someday. You can give me the answer yourself. If I find out, I'll let you know. Deborah has a question too. Yeah. You're on your if you have your hand raised. Oh, yeah, you got your, your hand up, uh, Deborah, Deborah Irwin. Oh, um, that's my mom. Um, yep. I have an Ice Age book that has a lot of pictures of what they think it could look like. Like, let's see if they're caveman. Here, there's a pop up picture. Oh, yeah. Ah, that is really oh, neat. So we what? know a lot about people during the Ice Age, like in that first pop-up. Yeah, there's Herbie right there. Uh, yeah. The problem with artifacts and stuff from the Ice Age is, say, a lot of this stuff like the clothes or tools like this that are made out of organic material, they, they rot away. So all we find is the hard stuff, like the stones and the rocks. And here's Esther. But, 
Yeah, there's Esther. But people and the animals during the Ice Age there, if they were a little bit more recent, we can learn a lot more about them. We can look at modern animals like that, like uh, your Esther there. They had her colored a lot like a modern lion. We can take those comparisons from artifacts or from bones and skeletons right up into the modern world and figure out what they looked like. Mm -hmm. Or it's a lot less likely that say like a T-Rex would look like a chicken. Here's the short face bear. Yeah. Oh, that's a neat book. I'll have to get to the library and check that one out. It's, I think it was a present for me. It was actually a present. All I right, very cool. I like the, uh, I like the cave village. I have to update my cave over here so that it looks like that. <laughs> we got one more question if you got time. Yeah, I got, uh, I got a couple minutes. So got one last question. So I see that when the Ice Age, you're showing these big, huge mastodons and the woolly mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers, and all these really big animals. But there's not like, you're not showing a lot of like chicken and lizard sized things. Is that because the small animals would not have had the body heat to really survive in the cooler eras? Or is it just that those sort of small animals don't really make for good fossilization? Uh, well, there's definitely some of that. Um, we do have a very good complete fossil record for small animals from the last ice age. Um, really mainly we just focus on the larger things because they look really big and impressive in the, in the yeah. display. Um, yeah. there are, uh, there are several sites where, uh, we have, uh, actually a complete cross section of the ecosystem from, uh, small rodents, shrews, moles, turtles, toads, stuff like that all the way up to woolly rhinos and mammoths, um, where actually we, we think it was the Yellowstone supervolcano erupted. And the consequent ash field buried and killed off an entire complete ecosystem across the Great Plains, uh, sure. kind of around where Nebraska and Wyoming, that area is now. Mm -hmm. And so we have very, very complete fossils of basically all the plants and animals that were in that area at that moment. Um, so they, they absolutely do exist. Uh, like I said, for the program here, it's just, uh, you know, bigger shows up on the screen. Um, and uh, because bigger is, you know, it looks better in the display. We have a, a more complete collection of the, the large animals. But, uh, but there's absolutely entire uh, field study on just like ice age rodents, things like horned gophers and uh, weird animals that are ancestors to all the little critters that we have running around in the woods today. Okay, cool. Thank you. And uh, interesting little side trivia. We actually think the Clovis culture, uh, some of the earliest North Americans, their primary meat source was turtles rather than mammoths because uh, they're small, easy to catch, and you can throw a turtle in a haversack and carry it for a couple of days. It stays alive, so the meat stays fresh. But we often find turtle shells and like rabbit bones and stuff associated with Clovis sites, even though they're thought of as mammoth hunting culture. So, uh, so the little animals were just as important as all of the big ones behind us. Sure, but uh, I know we're uh, we're right up against the the end of the program here. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the great questions, uh, for joining us here at Colossal Fossils for this. Uh, next week's program is Women of Science. Uh, we're going to talk about some scientists and researchers from the last uh, couple hundred years who have done some amazing stuff. It's a really neat program. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, we hope to see you all next week. So, night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. One, um, one thing that